It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a huge fan of both of these gentlemen um, and have been for a long time. Uh, my name is Eric Reynolds. I'm an associate publisher of Fanagraphics Books. I first met Dan in 1991 at a Comic Con as a fan where I stood in line and got a sketch from him a couple of years before I started working with him. And I started, uh, I didn't meet Charles for several years after that, but I did write him many fan letters when Kitchen Sink Press was publishing the first five issues of Black Hole and uh, when Kitchen Sink Press started to flounder a little bit. I'm not too ashamed to say that Kim Thompson and I were circling like wolves to <laughs> try to bring Charles into the fold. Um, so, this is, so this is really cool to be doing this, um, you know, 20, almost 25 years after that. Um, I want to leave some time for questions, so I'll ask a few and then let you guys chime in. Um, I have a few questions sort of uh, related to the, the themes of SPX. Um, but I wanted to start by asking you guys if you remember when you first were aware of each other's work and then when you subsequently met and became friends. I, I'm sure I saw Charles's work the first time in, in RAW. What issue? That would have been raw number like three or three, two. Like 881 or something like that. And I was like immediately so jealous because he was, he could do what I wanted to do. You know, he would like, could use the brush and draw in that old style. And it was, I just felt an immediate like connection to that and just total resentment and jealousy. <laughs> and, uh, and bought everything he ever did from that moment on. And I'm trying. I have no idea what year we would have met. We met in at Gary Groth's house in ah, Seattle. Right. Some good photos of that. Yeah, but I don't. I remember like we just immediately started talking about Windsor Newton brushes, <laughs> you know. And I remember. I, I remember like we were really in depth talking about brushes, and we were like, you know, what could you use number two or number three? And and then your uh, your wife came toward us, and you were like, hey, hey, "Yeah, so we're you know we're just you know you like really embarrassed that we were talking about brushes." And you like changed the subject, and uh, I don't remember that. At yeah, all. I, re I remember like, oh man, you know, this is I guess we are Ixnay pathetic the, nerds. Yeah, Ixnay on the Inzer Newton cave. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I was thinking about this too. There was a certain point where I would at least have a pretty good understanding of everything that was being published, or I would, I would like go and look for anything that was new or interesting, either when I was traveling or in the U.S. when I was like going to a comic book store, or a bookstore, and so yeah, I was I was aware of the kind of progress that you know like, uh, I'd see the Hernandez brothers, Love and Rockets, and then I remember seeing Lloyd Llewellyn. So that was the first. The, sure. I, I figured out later that you had done some earlier pieces, but that was my first introduction. And my sense was, um, I, maybe it was just like a kind of a, recogni a cultural recognition. There was, there was things that you were making reference to in your stories that, that I didn't think anybody else had, but it felt <laughs> anybody like Anybody something... gave a shit about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just, it, was, it was something that I kind of recognized immediately. And, and, and there was also like, Watching Dan's work progress over the years, there was just this one, one moment of, holy shit! I think it was. I mean, I liked everything up to that, but I remember reading the story caricature and just like completely being blown away by that. Um, that was like, that was a moment. <laughs> it's an amazing story, still is. Well, um, in the spirit of SPX, I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about. If you were, specifically if you remember the very first comic or, and or publication that you actually put together and, and, and either printed yourself or with friends or you know, kind, of, kind of packaged on your I own. Don't, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I will. Uh, yeah, you do that one. I mean, it, it sounds, I mean, it sounds odd to say, but there was, you know, when I was really little, I, I loved the idea of, of printing something or having a, 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 my own comic, but there just were real limitations as far as the technology goes. And then suddenly there was affordable, uh, you know, photocopy. Uh, you could get Xeroxes and, and go somewhere and, and get cheap copies. Uh, so early on, I would be putting together little booklets. 
I had, uh, well, I don't even know if I can say it in this crowd, but one of my first self-published pieces is called Weepy Gash. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. Uh, it's a reference trigger to Trigger warning. It's, it's from a, uh, yeah, trigger warning. It's from a William Burroughs story, and it's kind of a disgusting title. But uh, another thing I did was I did like a coloring book for some reason. I found, I found a photo, a place that would do Xeroxes, and I, and I actually cut out the cheapest newsprint paper that I could find and you know ran that through and did you know stapled together coloring books so hmm. I want one of those I, I, yeah I'll, really I think there's three left all right <laughs> you experimented with like with with photographic comics and stuff too pretty early on yeah you? yeah I mean yeah I did uh, the one the one problem or one of the limitations with with any color printing at that time there was color xeroxes but for eight and a half by 11 sheet, it was like a dollar per page. And I was like, oh, that was like, at that point, I was like, maybe I can cut this down and, and use it for, you know, you know two, two pieces for a cover, but it was just too expensive. Yeah, I remember like, was, like never making a color Xerox because yeah. it was just prohibitive. It was like, it's a yeah. dollar. Mm -hmm. and it was a weird, it was a very strange <laughs> look to it that I liked. It was kind of this plastic. It, it was, looked terrible. Yeah, yeah, but in a specific great way. If, if you look at, uh, <laughs> Gary Panter's, like he did books, yeah. self-published yeah. books, and he somehow finessed this way to make those things look perfect. He like accepted what it was right. and, and worked within we the, were, we were the too, confines, yeah. We were too anal retentive for yes, that. Yes, yes. <laughs> so when you guys were young cartoonists, um, or young aspiring cartoonists, do you, can you talk a little bit about when you first sort of started to interact with other cartoonists and sort of find your, you know, your community of, of like-minded weirdos? And for me, it was um, when I was in art school. I was, I was like a kid obsessed with, you know, early Mad Magazine and like Bernie Krigstein and all this very obscure stuff. And I had no friends who had yeah. the same interests at all. You know, I would have to just find the things that other comic nerds were interested in, like Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. And that was like it. But the stuff that I really liked, you know, Johnny Craig and, and things like that, and, and even more obscure early strips and things like that, it was impossible to find anybody. So when I went to New York and went to art school, all of a sudden, these you'd be in a class and you'd see this guy, you know, doodling like a crazy cat kind of a style, and you'd think like, oh, there, you know, this might be one of my friends. And, you know, it, I would, over years, kind of accumulate these weirdo shut-in guys who were who were had the same interests and then you know and after a while you uh, you find you have this little circle of of oddball friends so that you know that was the first time for me do you still do you still crave that kind of interaction with you know with with your like-minded weirdo friends? yeah yeah I mean it's to me the most valuable people in my life are are mostly crazy obsessive people who actually really know stuff you know it's very rare in this world that people know things you know that you meet somebody who's got like an expert knowledge on some subject that often no one else is interested in except for them and they spend all their time that to me those people are like gold you know that's the most valuable thing you can find in a friend I think mm -hmm. what about you well when I, I was I always loved comics and moved around a lot and grew up primarily in Seattle. Uh, one thing good about Seattle is that it rains a lot. It's kind of gray out, so you, you can spend a lot of time indoors. And I would force my, none of my friends were really into comics, but I forced them to do comics. We're sitting down and doing a comic today. So I would make them do uh, like a parody of, you know, a parody of some Marvel comic or med sort of comic. Uh, but in answer to your question, as far as like really meeting other cartoonists, I had gone to more like a, like a fine art school, and I knew that side of of you know the world. But I and, and people would see some things that I was doing that were kind of comics or comics related, uh, and there just wasn't any reaction. Uh, so it wasn't until I moved out to Pennsylvania or to Philadelphia and started going up to New York, I I saw. The first issue of Raw Magazine knocked on Art Spiegelman's door. He was all pissed off and 
<laughs> told me to send some Xeroxes in my work, but that was really the start. Uh, through, through those early, early years meeting Art and all the people that came through his house and the artists that I really respected. See, I mean, I'd seen Gary Panter's work in, in Los Angeles in, in you know, punk, punk fanzines, uh, Slash magazine there, and you know, I knew that. I had seen Kaz uh, in the New York Rocker up in, in New York. Like, how the fuck did he get that? And he does, you know, mm, I, I need to be in that, that magazine. Punk. I, had, I had done some, some things for, uh, oh, a, mag, a tabloid, punk tabloid in, in, out of Oakland called Another Room, I think it was called. Um, so there's things that I was aware of I would see a little bit here and there, and then it really seemed to kind of find a way into Raw Magazine. There was, there was kind of the American artists that I was interested in, and then there was European artists that I either know or was introduced to. So I got to meet those people as they were, you know, so-and-so is gonna be in town from Amsterdam, so I would drive up and now this, meet this, them. This was after you went to Evergreen? Yeah, yeah, this is well after <clears throat> that. So you, you, you were friends with Matt Groening and Linda Berry in Evergreen, mm -hmm. and and then, but I was pretty antisocial. I mean, I knew them, but I wasn't. You know, I didn't hang out with them. And Matt Groening, he was he was not a. I never thought of him as a cartoonist at the time. He wrote, and he wrote for the paper. And you'd occasionally see a little doodle, but he wasn't doing comics per se. Oh, okay. uh, Linda was. Linda had. I had. I did comics for the paper there, and I knew Linda from high school actually. Um, so yeah, I remember same thing there. It was like, God, she has a book published. How did she? You know, she. Did, how come I don't have a book? <laughs> uh, because she worked her ass off and she, you know, did you know, created something and. Did you really just go up to Spiegelman's door like yeah. without yeah. calling? Well, in, in the very yeah. in the very first the very first issue it didn't happen after that but the first issue, uh, which had a pretty low print run but it was it was around New York a lot you would you yeah see yeah it was posters um, everywhere yeah even posters yeah. Uh, so it, and I looked at them out there. You were talking about uh, the other day about showing your portfolio for yeah. trying to get illustrations. So I was up there doing that and saw, picked up Raw Magazine. It said we're interested in submissions, and there was an address there. I thought, oh, that's around the corner. <laughs> they didn't so, mean like show up at their door. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that was a, like when I when I first went to art school and met other like young artists. They were like, just look up artists in the phone book and go to their house and knock on their door. You know, they're all really nice, and they'd always have these stories of like, oh, I went over to. Bob Peake's house, you know, just famous illustrators and stuff. And, uh, and I remember, like, me and Rick Alter got once, like, we took the train to go to Mort Drucker's house, like, in <laughs> Long Island. Like, we just, like, oh, there he is. And we were, like, we were already going to his house without even, like, we weren't even going to call or anything. And then, and then we got, we got kind of nervous. And we're, like, we should call. And, like, Mrs. Drucker was, like, N what are you thinking? You know, like, no. And some, somebody came to my house. I was, like, call the police. <laughs> Didn't you, did you and Rick Altergott go, did you guys go to Ditko's studio once? No, I went, I went by myself. Okay. <laughs> no, that was a huge, huge uh, debacle. <laughs> that was really, I, I was like, I just looked in the phone book when I moved to New York, 1978, and it, uh, in the phone book it actually said, S. Ditko, artist. <laughs> in the yellow pages, like under artist. <laughs> and, it, and it had an address on 42nd Street. And so I thought, well, I'll go, uh, I just want to go see if this is really where, he was my hero, you know, and I was like, I'm just going to see if that's really where he lived. I just wanted to see, like, his name on the marquee, kind of. And I go, and it was in, like, the sleaziest porn theater. And you'd, like, you know, when you talk about, like, the taxi driver era of New York, you know, this was just disgusting. I remember, I remember there was a... Uh, there was like a booth as I walked into the lobby that had a movie playing that was called Dr. Motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Good memory. <laughs> and, so, and so I go into the lobby and there's, it was very sort of Barton Finkish. There was just like a lonely uh, attendant guy there sitting in a uniform, just sitting there like literally staring ahead, like twiddling his thumbs. And he's like, can I help you? And I'm looking at the marquee, and, and, he, and I'm like, I'm, there's a guy named Steve Ditko who, who uh, lives here. And he's like, never heard of him. I've been here eight years, never heard of him. And I look on the marquee, and I'm like, it, right here, Steve Ditko. And he goes, oh, I'll take you right up. <laughs> and I was like, um, OK. Yeah, he didn't want to be like, no, I'm just here to like, see if he's here. <laughs> like, I felt weird. So I was sort of like, OK, shit. 
And so I go up in this old, like, hand crank elevator. It's like, you know, we're going up like, you know, like I'm like with Elisha Cook Jr. in the <laughs> elevator. And, uh, and we get out, and it's just, there's a door. And he's, that's it? There? And the doorman guy's standing there sort of smiling, like, I brought you here. This guy's literally the world's worst doorman, <laughs> like encouraging, you know, intruders. And so I go over to this door and I tap on the door, and the door opens chain length, and he, and I hear this voice go, "What do you want?" <laughs> like I had read the word "use," Y-O-U-S-C for you. I was like, "What is that?" Like I'm from Chicago, we don't say "use," but this was it. I had heard "use." What do you want? And I could see in the background, I could see like layouts taped on the wall and stuff. And I, and I went like, are, are you Steve Ditko, the comic artist? And he went, go away, and slammed the door. <laughs> and the doorman guy was kind of like, oh man. <laughs> I'm sure Ditko had him fired yeah. later that afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> but because of that, he's still kind of my hero. Like the thing I love about Ditko is that He's never befriended a bunch of like douchey cartoonists. <laughs> like, he's he's his own guy. He's just like completely untainted by any any other associations. You know, he's he's like completely uh, a singular character. Yeah. Did you ever have any kind of connection to any you know cartoonists of an older generation like that? I think that's kind of an interesting thing about SPX. There's this generational continuity that you don't really see at other shows. It's, it's just more of a, a mishmash of everything. And here you really feel this kind of uh, you know, passage of time and, and, and you, see, you see how things kind of evolve over the years. I mean, I've been coming to SPX now for 20 years and you guys have both been, been here off and on for probably well over a decade. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I, I didn't really know. I didn't... I was really, you know, I, I, I learned things through books. I would go to the library and pull out books, and, and I didn't really meet another cartoonist until, like I said, until Art Spiegelman until opened his door. Until he knocked on his door. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing? No, he didn't say What, what he is he one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, my second meeting with Art Spiegelman was very, you know, he, he that's when everyone mailed things to him. Anyway, I mailed some, some photocopies up, and he set up a time to meet, and you know, went up and hung out in his hippie pad and uh, showed my work to him. There's, there was one moment where, I mean, I was doing some, some, some pieces that didn't really have a, you know, a typical narrative. They were just, they're kind of collages of images. And I remember, like, there was one page that was a, this big piece, and he was just, like, looking at it for a long, long time. I go, oh, fuck. <laughs> and then finally, like, well, what's happening over here? And I'm like, no, no, no. You never explain anything. I'm like, okay. That was for me. That was like acknowledged that he was a person to talk to, that you know understood. I was, I like that attitude. That yeah, he, he was just spending his time to dive into the piece. So yeah, he was he was one of the first <coughs> people I met. And then after that, a, a whole bunch of people. There was a lot of cartoonists in New York at that time, so I got to meet, and hang out with them. So talking about color Xeroxes and sending things through the mail. And when I was in college in the late 80s and early 90s, I was like the last generation to sort of go through college without using computers, really. And I worked on the newspaper. I learned how to cut ruby lith to do color saps. And I learned how to operate a stack camera. All of stuff literally like within five, within five years of graduating from college were completely obsolete technology. And, and it's not even stuff that you could just bring back, you no. know, ironically. Like it's just Tools don't useless. Use yeah. Yeah. They don't. They don't. Yeah. You can't service the machines. Yeah. That, exactly. Know, no, no one knows how to do any of this. You can't buy part replacement parts yeah, or yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. So you guys both came of age in this kind of in the kind of analog years, but yet you've both thoroughly adapted to modern technology along the ways. I think you both were like pretty early adopters of, of computers and doing your own color separations and things like that. And has that has that affected the way that you do the work or approach the work or think about the work? Well one thing that's really great is just like the the control that you have over your work as far as uh, instead of like sending your your artwork through the mail and hoping for the best uh, or hoping someone's going to scan it properly uh, you can control every aspect of that and, and as far as color printing goes 
just the quality of what you can do and, and what you can put together on a computer is yeah. amazing. It's I just I always wanted that flat comic book yeah. color. I just wanted there to be no inflection at all. And so I spent years like trying to figure out painting techniques and all kinds of stuff to yeah, replicate that flat that. color. And it just never felt right. And then when the computer thing came along, I realized, you know, oh, you can pick like the exact colors you want. Like before that, there used to be a system that Fantagraphics would use occasionally where you would get like a Xerox of your work, you'd paint it with watercolor, and then you would label it with yeah. these little numbers like R3B7, and you would send it in to some poor guy who would then, I guess, enter all that in an early computer, mm -hmm. like a Univac or something, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then it would come out with these just like eye-meltingly garish color. Like you would get the comics and just be like, oh my, you know, I can't even look at it. And it was just a total crapshoot. Like you, it was really, really hard to just look at a little color chart with a tiny square of red and go, oh, how's that going to look, you know, over here? And uh, so like some of those early eight balls are colored in that method. And it was, it, it was just a... A complete shock to see the the issue. You had no idea, and it was never even in the realm of what I was imagining. Did, did you ever do? Did you ever do hand cut separations? I did hand cut separations. Does I anybody did, here know what a hand cut separation would be? It basically would be the same. You should you should learn hand. about it. It's really fascinating. <laughs> it's like doing three. If you have a piece of artwork, black and white artwork, you put three sheets of acetate on top. And after you've analyzed what each color should be, like, okay, your flesh color is going to be 20% yellow and 20% uh, cyan. So you have to get a little piece of zipatone, make sure it's turned the right direction with your, with your, <laughs> then you cut it out, that one little thing, but that's the face. And the, the next sheet, the yellow it was sheet, insanely you gotta, you gotta, you gotta complicated. Get the, the it other was... direction. That's, it's like, Four or five days later, you have one page. Like, like to learn to do that, we could have learned to do like rocketry and been, you know, work for NASA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in a, in a way, it was the same sort of that provided the same kind of control because you knew what twenty percent. You know. Except then the printer would always yeah. like, "Oops, we left off the cyan." Yes. <laughs> so. Back then, you like now. If somebody, if a printer totally misprinted it, you would say you got to reprint oh, yeah? it. You but back in the old mind. days, Kim Thompson would be like, "We, you know, they're so cheap. We can't ask them to reprint it. You know, sorry." Yeah, that, well, no, that's true. Yeah. When, when I when I was doing work for uh, Francoise Mouly and Art Spiegelman, who edited Raw, I mean, she knew she had a printing press in her in, in their place, and and she learned all that technology. She was like a a genius in that regard, and she would go down to the actual printer and oversee that. And I just remember stories, you know, she's waiting, she's I need a little more yellow, and I'm like, no, no, it's fine. And then the guy would be out of the room, she's climbing up on top of the printer and, you know, scooting her across. <laughs> so she was kind of fearless as far as just really making things look perfect, and, and that's why those magazines look so good, um, that kind of control. I wonder if that's where Chris Ware... Chris, Chris is of the, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I, he knows, yeah, his, his is kind of frightening, he's like, his knowledge of, his skills are pretty amazing when it comes to, you know, yeah, pre printing technology, yeah, yeah printing he technology knows that is stuff. It's like scary. Um, the other big shift, I think, that I would point to as a, being a cartoonist over the past 30 years is the shift from periodicals to long form books. And... When you guys were doing Black Hole and 8-Ball, I would compulsively, every time a new issue of you know 8-Ball came out with Like a Velvet Glove or a new issue of Black Hole came out, I would compulsively go back and reread the prior chapters before I read the new chapter. And it was like I was trying to parse clues, you know, like, like I was listening to Beatles records backwards or something, you know, trying to, to, to parse the, the, the hidden meanings. And I'm wondering how that serialization process ha you know, affected your work then and how the lack of, of serialization sort of you know, has, has changed the way you, you write or think about a work or, I mean, I think, I think you've said before that Velvet Glove was more or less kind of automatic writing. Yeah, but you know, you could, I tried not to pay too much attention to how people were, were responding to mm -hmm. it as I was working on it, but you could, you know, you could feel that certain things were were um, resonating 
with people. And so I would, I was somewhat influenced by that, you know, because I didn't really have a big plan as I was going in. So things that people seemed to respond to, I would sort of lean more in that direction. And so it did have somewhat of an effect. Is it harder to, you know, delay that gratification of getting it out there for people to see? You know, as opposed to having a comic every three or four months, it's now maybe three or four years. Yeah. I don't know. It's fine with me, kind of. Like, I I used to really enjoy that, like, just getting it out there. But it felt like, um, it felt like more of a, like I was the center of a community. And I felt this, like, responsibility to, like, get the thing out there and to, like, I'd have all these people who'd write letters and I would sort of coordinate that and I would, I would even, like, somebody would write me a letter that mentioned something that somebody else had written me a letter about and I would like put these people in touch, you mm-hmm. know, and wow. it was, it, I was like the internet, you know, yeah, basically yeah. <laughs> before it existed. And, uh, and once nobody needed that, and once people stopped writing letters, it did, I didn't feel that need to like, to, to be that sure. immediate, you know, it was a very different feeling. Do you feel like, like Black Hole would have been different if, it probably it may not have existed. I mean, it, it was good for me in the sense that it did give me some, I mean, I'm incredibly slow anyway, but it gave me some sense of, like, something that's coming out periodically. Um, yeah, it was a situation I wanted to tell a long story, and maybe having, you know, something serialized and there's only one or two issues a year, it's not, it, you, that's the reason you had to reread everything, because, like, what's going on now? <laughs> well, that's uh, exactly true. But, but, I mean... <laughs> With Dan's work, you, you had some pieces that were serialized, and then there's some short pieces. So there was a there was a range of things, and be, you know, before I started Black Hole, I had done I had done like a weekly strip, but even that I was doing like a weekly strip, but it was a continued story. And I can't imagine that. I mean, I heard from some people who were saying like, yeah, I clip them out of the paper and I read them as a as a full story. But it was like, with a weekly strip, you want to have something self-contained. It might have some. Anyway, I was always I never quite did it correctly but anyway um, both of you guys have done comics about adolescence basically and you've kind of uh, you've done comics about I think what I'd say are like kind of old soul adolescent characters like Enid Coleslaw and Ghost World and you've also kind of done stories that I think um, are, are like point of view characters sort of looking back on adolescence and I think you both continue to do that very well, sort of tapping into your 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 childhood or your adolescence and and infusing that in your in your work kind of looking looking back in a way that I'm wondering as you do get older do you feel do you feel more removed from from that mindset or is it just as or do you still just kind of can you just kind of mine that vein it's it's a hard thing to say i mean i i'm aware of what you're talking about i I think i think there's so so many i don't know there is it's a part of your life that kind of transition it's a part of that life where where your life a lot of things are going on i mean for me it's like yeah i've been sitting in my studio you know in that chair for the last you know 15 20 years so it's amazing i don't have a lot (laughs) it's amazing how like a life drawing comics you can I, like I sometimes sort of space out and I think like I oh, am yeah, like 31 like I really it's like just like it, the years condense into nothing and it, you think like what was I doing for that decade I oh, just like that draw, white drawing board you know I'm saying it's like that really feel and then you know and then you think of all the things you actually did and it seems like a long time mm-hmm. but everything focused on on drawing comics seems like nothing and I feel like oh, I've done I've only done like 10 pages in my life you know and then you see the stacks of things I can't even go through all the stuff I've done at this point <laughs> well as parents um, you know continuing on that same thought you know you, you, you guys have kids and you've raised kids you're yeah. raising a kid and has um, uh, as a parent you you, you are suddenly thrust into different communities than than you were for your entire adult life up to that point. Right. You've sort of lived in this vacuum. I don't of your tell own anybody what I do. <laughs> and, I'm yeah. an illustrator. Yeah. Has has <laughs> sort movies. of you know experiencing the world as a parent, not just in terms of the responsibility of being a parent, but literally like being being thrust into different relationships beyond just being a parent. 
And ha have you found that that's like giving you, you know, either more grist for the mill or does it change the way that, you know, you kind of, do you, you see things differently, sort of viewed through the prism of being a parent that's in, that in a way that's affected the work? I, I used to deny it, but I don't think that's <laughs> true. I mean, I, I don't like the idea that, that, you know, whatever kind of horrendous storyline I'm working on has anything to do with <laughs> my family that I love. Uh, but you know that being, that being <laughs> said, I, I, having you know, I had two daughters, and there was a certain. The joke was, you know, they'd come in my room, and early on, I was like, "You can you can read this when you're 18." And my and my eldest daughter did sit down and read it, and my youngest daughter, who's a little bit more like me emotionally, uh, said that she didn't want to, and I really respected her for that. Like, oh, good, I know why. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I think you know, raising daughters and being with them and, and their personalities and seeing them go through their adolescence or their, all, all those things. And just, it's, it's not that I'm using that as, as, no, par, no. as part of the storyline, but I can, emotionally I can see, I get, so, I'm, I'm going through, I'm not going through that with them, but I'm, I'm seeing that and recognizing it. So it does, I think it does affect that. I, I was always a little bit squeamish about, you know, even admitting that that had any Part I mean, it had any effect, but it's like all you think about are you know when you have a kid, you you know, and my son is in seventh grade right now, so I'm reliving seventh grade. Yeah, and I've been reliving every year, you know, and so it's just unbelievably, you know, everything flows back and it just triggers. And you. all of his friends are like analogs to my early friends, you know. I even like accidentally call them by my friend's <laughs> name <laughs> sometimes, like, "Oh, you're hanging out with Paul," and he's like, "Who's Paul?" I'm like, "Oh, shit. <laughs> and and you immediately know, like, that kid's no good, you know, that kid's <laughs> like that. Don't hang out with that kid. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My I, son's I, very, very uh, earnest. He like very like believes what kids say, and he'll, uh, he had a friend who uh, who told him that he had seen the new Star Wars before it came out, and uh, and he said that the the beginning of Star Wars was that um, was that uh, Kylo Ren drops an atom bomb on the Ewoks and <laughs> kills them all. <laughs> And then, and then he said, the end of the movie is that all the all the Star Wars characters, like Princess Leia, Luke, C three PO, they all stand around Kylo Ren and take turns stabbing him. <laughs> that would have been a much better. And movie. I was like, I was like, what if? What if? <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure how to follow that one. Um, so we're here at SPX and we're talking, you know, there's all this talk about comics. What's going on in comics? What's, you know, what, how have comics changed? How has SPX changed? And this is a really vague question, but to preface it, I would say that, you know, 20 years ago, we used to think like, oh, if we can just like get our books out of the hands of the, the weekly Marvel and DC collectors and into the hands of, you know, intelligent, literate people, then, you know, all will be right with the world and the cosmic balance will be restored and and that kind of happened maybe not in a way that was the panacea we all thought but is there is there anything about the sort of community of comics that you would you would sort of like to see the conversation move in a different direction or be reframed in a in a, like a, a, very, very I feel like the question. community of comics is so vast now. It's so multifaceted sure. that you can yeah. there can be people who you see their work and they and it's completely like well done and everything looks great and you just I don't have any interest in it. And and there's millions of facets of that. And it used to be just like you knew everything yeah. that was published. Yeah, you know, I mean, like that, when, that. when my early comics came out, I remember getting a Xerox list of every comic that month. And there were like 80 comics, something like that. And it was Marvel, DC, and then like yeah. f Flaming Carrot and, yeah. you know. Elf Quest. And Elf Quest. Yeah, and, and it was such a limited number. A lot of people just bought every comic. And now it's, you know, it's that 9,000 page catalog that you were like, I don't know what anything is, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, I don't think you can even refer to comics as anything but this 
vast. Extremely stratified. Yeah, I mean, it's like talking about books at this point, you know. It's, no, it's pretty, it's, it is pretty amazing. And I really did have some, yeah, I did the same thing. I mean, I bought, I look back at some of the things I bought, like, why would I ever, ever read this? But it was like, You're just oh, desperate because it, because for anything, yeah. Because it's a new comic. So, yeah. yeah, I was like being aware of all those things. I, but anyway, I, yeah, I, like, I like the idea that there's a, a huge range of possibilities, whether, you know, if someone's going to do a big, giant, thick book, or just, you know, I love, you know, hand-stapled pieces, too. They're, they're, I mean, it all it all works. It, when I was when I was starting out, I was like thinking of it as you know, like this is the only thing I can do, whether it's going to be illustration or comics. But I just didn't know how to, you know, find my way out in that world. So it was like they're just I'm not going to work for Marvel or DC. Undergrounds are dead. There were and then there was just this first little hints of things that transcended that stuff, or was or, or were starting to come out. Uh, so there was like. Weirdo and Raw Magazine, kind of two yeah, sides the two of the poles. spectrum, and then and then you know Fantagraphics and other handful of other small publishers. But it just built really slowly. I mean, like trying to, you know, like maybe I'll do a gag cart. You know, like, I just want to, you, know, you know, I'm not a gag <laughs> cartoon, but I, mean, I actually have like you know three ghost or four, high and three or four <laughs> gag cartoons, and they're just the worst gag cartoons. Well, so you see it in SPX where, you know, like in the Ignatz Awards last night where you can have like Carol Tyler's memoir about World War II yeah. up against, you know, a, a 20 year old's mini comic. And it really speaks to the kind of, you know, well, the kind of spectrum of things. If, yeah. it's, if it's good, it's good. You know, whether it's five copies right. of it or whether it's like this, you know, bound in uh, pig, fetal pig leather or something. I don't know. <laughs> Um, you had you had an in Ignatz anecdote that you oh I, yeah it was just I, I had um, I had an actual story about an actual Ignatz award that it's the only thing that's ever happened to me in my life that's that feels similar to a biblical parable <laughs> it's you know like something that ha would happen to Job or something so so one year I won an Ignatz award, this must be 10 or more years ago, and they said, I think you probably sent it to me in the mail, you know, it's the brick on the thing. And <clears throat> I always have this kind of ambivalence about awards, I sort of don't think art should be a competition in any way, and so, but I'm also really proud to win an award, it's always, always cool to win an award, but then I'm sort of embarrassed that I'm proud, so it's just this kind of endless loop of anxiety and weirdness. So, so I get the award and I put it on my mantelpiece in my old house, like above the fireplace. And above that, I have this painting that was my prized possession. I'd spent all the money I had at one point to buy a painting by this paperback cover artist named James Avati, who was kind of like the great paperback artist. He did the original Catcher in the Rye cover. And this was just this beautiful painting that brought endless joy to my life. I would, you know, sit there every night at dinner and look at this painting. And so that was on the wall, there's the Ignatz Award. And so one day I'm upstairs drawing and I hear this crash, like just a horrible crash. And I'm like, okay, what did my dog do? And I actually thought my dog had like knocked the TV over or something. And so I came downstairs and I look on the floor and there is my painting broken in half, pieces all over the floor with the brick on top of it, which is literally impossible. Like, like the painting was up here, the brick is here. So it would have, the only explanation, which doesn't make any sense, is that the painting like hit the brick, then landed, and the brick was sort of teetering, and then landed on the painting. The painting landed sort of at an angle, so the brick just went And it was on this brittle old illustration board, and it literally, it, split cleanly in half with just chips of 1950s oil paint all over the floor. Like it's absolutely destroyed. And there's, I leave that to everyone else to interpret what that means. <laughs> I think that's a good place to open the floor to a few yeah. questions or interpretations. Yeah. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? We've got a microphone right here. I actually wanted to ask Charles, uh, with the advent of the new MTV channel, do you anticipate uh, garnering a, a new audience for your work when they're showing the, the animation, um, Dog Boy specifically, 
Uh, the, Are they going to be showing that? Yeah, they're showing like liquid television oh, and all that really? stuff. Really? Oh, I'm wondering if you outed now. Yeah, I'm wondering if they even might get a new audience out of that, or if it's oh. just masturbatory. It's a, it's a, it was a weird project. I did. There used to be a, a, a half an hour show on MTV uh, when they're kind of expanding from from just playing music videos, uh, and it was it was primarily animation. But I I had I had been in contact with a, a British director who had, who did who filmed commercials. So that, that was that's what he knew about. But he wanted to branch out, and he liked my work. And somehow I can't even remember how it all worked out, but he negotiated with MTV to do to do a, you know to ten episodes of Dog Boy, my character. It was kind of like a proto Adult Swim or something. Yeah, like that. I, I don't know what the reference would be now, but anyway, it was one of those things where I I was involved with it. What he wanted to do is have you know characters dressed up like and, and make the sets look like my comics, which is always a weird thing to make something flat 3D. Uh, and then wear these kind of plastic, you know, plastic hair and everything. Uh, what what happened was I I wrote the entire script, so it had, you know, ten episodes, beginning, middle, and end. Um, and he started filming it, and I saw a little bit of it at the beginning, slow process, and then finally I saw, you know, all ten pieces that he'd done. And by the time he got to the end, I just I didn't know what had happened to my script. There was just things that were left out. I said, well, what happened to this scene in this? I, oh, we ran out of money, so we just didn't include that. <laughs> I was like, you know, why does your story count at all? And I was just like, you know, so I can't, I can't even look at it now. I just, it's, I've tried to on occasion to go back, and there's just something kind of, I don't, you know, it's, it's not for me. It didn't really even look like your no, stuff no, I, in any way. Like, was, nobody I mean, was, would make the it was connection. A strange, I think there, there's a show called Max Headroom. There's like these big oh, yeah. plastic, so everything looks kind of bright and, and, and the odd, an other odd thing, too, is that he was filmed in, it was filmed in London, and all the actors are British, but they're doing American accents. And to his ear, it sounded like, oh, that's perfect American asshole. Hello, governor. <laughs> yeah. Use. And, but it just Use. sounded, it sounded so, <laughs> some of it just sounded really strange. It wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't American English, and it wasn't British. It was just an odd feeling. So anyway, I'm sorry to hear that it's going <laughs> to. <laughs> Thanks for the bad news. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm going to avoid doing an American accent, but it was very tempting. Um, <laughs> Do, go ahead. This is terrible, actually. Um, I'm curious as to two questions. You can answer either of them if you like. One is, could you kind of get a better sense of the process of slowness and how it works for either of you, both of you? Um, what are the kind of obstacles of speed and pr producing work? Um, and the other, what works of yours do you look back as most fondly at your most appreciative of it as, as a sense of achievement? And is there anything you don't like you've done? And why, <laughs> people tell us why those you like and dislike. You, I mean, Thank you. it's a cliche, but I, you really do think of your work like your children. And so if you have, a, if you have an unsuccessful, you know, meth-addicted child, you still love that as much as you do <laughs> the, you know, the one who went to Sarah Lawrence, you know, so. <laughs> so you can't play favorites. You have, to, you have to, you know, embrace them all equally. But I didn't quite get the first question about the... The slowness is, I think... You the slowness of creating the work, or yeah, this... what are the kind of ordinary and other set of obstacles that you encounter with your speed of work, and how do you, f do you feel you're slow? I think you mentioned earlier. Yeah, we, I, I think we're both slow. very slow. I mean, I mean, it's... I don't want to make judgments. No, I'm yeah. slower. I'm slower. <laughs> no, I don't know about that, but it, it, there, it, I would love to be able to, to just have the idea and immediately get it onto the page, but that would, it wouldn't be what I want out into the world, you know, you, there's a certain process that is involved in sifting through everything and, and spending that time, and it becomes this kind of meditative process where even, you know, cutting out the paper, drawing the panel lines, all those things, your brain starts to get acclimated to, to using that time to think of other ideas, future ideas, and that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process that you have to kind of embrace, and you have to know yourself, you have to not fool yourself into like, I'm going to crank this out in, in two weeks. You know, you have to really go along with the program that you created for yourself. Yeah, I, I mean, I really admire, you know, fellow cartoonists that, that, that work quickly or, or more directly. Um, 
you know, so I don't, I don't, you know, have some judgment on, you know, someone did, you know, five pages today, and you know, I, it took me two weeks to do one page. So I don't, I, I, I don't care about that. It's just, I mean, those are my limitations. If I, you know, it'll, it'll take me X amount of hours to make this, mark this, mark this, mark. You know, it, it's because that's what I, I know. Well, I hope I know what those things are, uh, and and it is, it is just. That's how long it takes, you know, sit there with layers of drawings and turning it around and sifting through it. And it, and it really, it's, it, can be, it can be really frustrating, um, but can't go back now. <laughs> it's too late to start it's over. Too, like Wally would. It's too late. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. So earlier you'd said that, or I'm sorry, Dan, you had, you had said, that um, although there's a lot of great work out right now, you don't find yourself being able to really find the time or the interest to, to take a look at it. No, I didn't say that. Well, That's I'm not sorry, at all what I said. Those, <laughs> I, I, I misunderstood. Then, but that, that, I'm saying there's a, such a vast just, amount of work that there are things that I'm super interested in to things I'm somewhat interested in to things I'm not interested in, but that are all possibly very well done. And I'm saying back in the old days when, when he and I began, anything that was well done you would, you would buy and read and, it, and now there's so much stuff that you can really pick and choose what you're actually really interested in as you would in books or movies or any other medium. So, so what then is it that attracts for, for both of you when you when you see when you see a book now what is it that that makes you gravitate towards it I'm always looking for something that's distinctive you know that seems like someone who's working out of their own head and has a has a vision that you can tell is their vision they've struggled to get on paper that's exactly the way they see the world and they're really trying to get that out to the rest of the world. That's, to me, the main thing. Things that are personal, things that are, um, that don't feel like they're trying to fit into a, a, you know, like a marketplace at all. That's the kind of stuff that I'm always drawn to. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's pretty much the same for myself. I mean, generally with comics, you can, you can look at them and you get some sense, or I get some sense immediately whether it's whether I'm interested in it or not. Obviously, you have to sit and read. I mean, there's been situations where there's, there's artists that haven't been translated Europe, you know, from Europe and other places, and I look, and it was, there's that frustration of not being able to read the story. And there, unfortunately, have been some cases where I really admired the artwork, and then I finally read the translation, and it's like, oh, shit, this is horrible. <laughs> or at least not very, you know, maybe I was projecting something else onto yeah. it. Um, but, and, and pretty rarely, there's been a few times, but rarely have I, you know, picked something up and go, ugh, and then found out, there's been a few occasions where I found out later when I sat and read it, like, oh, this works. The, whatever I objected to in the artwork became invisible and you're immersed into the story. And so, you know, that's, you know, you know just some, something that's genuine and something that is, is not, not chasing after someone else's vision or chasing after uh, a, a commercial product. Because um, if you're doing that, then you're lost. <laughs> yeah. If you're not doing it for yourself, you're, it's, you're lost. Great. Thank you both. Yeah. So I started reading stuff um, with Weirdo and found a raw in a comic book shop. And it was such a difference in style. Um, but I was hooked on the new stuff, Love and Rockets. And everything from that era. What was it like being that new generation? Because those artists are still drawing mm -hmm. from that, but there are, the, the work is different, the topics are different, it's less cutting edge. What was it like being the first? We were, ta we were talking about, and, and you had this kind of polarity, not, it wasn't, on one side you'd have Weirdo, which it was- was the East Coast, West Coast rivalry. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, was edited by, it was edited by Robert Crumb, and he had, he had, you know, he, he had his taste, and he had some very kind of goofy, funky. Pr primitive, <laughs> funky things. He, li he liked very genuine things, but his idea was, you know, he had different ideas what that was. Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly, on the other hand, came, she had, you know, the influence of growing up in France and, and reading comics there. Uh, and and he he they both together they really 
wanted to kind of turn their back on underground comics. So they were, I think the, the, it, was, it was a comics and graphics magazine, meaning it, it, the first issues had a lot of full page pieces of artwork and there weren't, there, it wasn't really concentrating on the narrative as much. So I kind of came from that art world background doing art comics and, it, and I liked both. I liked narrative and I liked you know, just the visuals. And so seeing, seeing this magazine that was printed this big, beautiful, it just, it felt like the... To, to see those early raws, like the ones you were in, and to see all of a sudden, for the first time, Drew Friedman, Charles Burns, Kaz, people like Kathy Millett, you know, work that was really, like, you just never seen before in yeah. comics. It was astounding to be 18 years old. I was, I think, 18 when raw number one came out and I was living in New York and I'd see the posters all over town for it and I mean I I couldn't have been more blown away by it I mean I, I was I mean I would be there during the editing process and, and you know they would have all the artwork all over the place and it'd be you know for one page it was almost it was like I don't know, um, you know we'll give this person one page but it'd be like three months later it should be this one this one. So it was the whole process, you know, there was, no, there was nothing very, you know, it was so intense trying to find this, you know, artwork. Anyway, it, for me, it, it, it's, it was kind of being in that or being there at that time felt like what I'd kind of imagined that I'd want to be involved with. I mean, I was aware of underground comics and liked them, but this was, it was kind of going in that direction that, you know, like I said, graphics and the scale production values, all those things I really enjoyed and cared about. Like, so. Thank you. And I will say that was really what continued to keep me going, was finding those raws after looking, at, having half, had undergrounds for years, mm -hmm. and then seeing raw and new artists and new narratives. And right. Yeah. They, yeah. Um, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Hi. Um, you talked about how um, technological processes have um, made uh, production more accessible, which has resulted in um, expanding the breadth of um, comics, uh, both visually, stylistically, um, uh, but it's also uh, resulted in a massive influx of like media and imagery. And I was wondering whether ethical consumption and curation of media is a problem, or is, uh, should be addressed um, through comics. Um, and what are some works that you've seen that have um, approach that problem. You can take that one. <laughs> okay. no, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I understand. Yeah, I didn't I'm understand. Just, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, oh no. What do you mean by uh, the uh, by ethical? Should there be an ethical consumption? Um, right. Or uh, so as far as um, images and uh, um, media, ha um, just as a result of having um, all of that information more accessible, um, comes with the anxiety of like acknowledging like its origins and um, uh, I mean, people and like reusing other people's imagery and yeah. appropriating imagery and stuff like God, that. I've been doing right. that my entire life. I just, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, that's part of, yeah. I hate, you it know, has to be done hard. artfully. That's right. my feeling. You have to bring something to your stealing. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there's, for me, there's like that, that's kind of how I grew up, is like looking at comics and copying those things, and it's still it's still a big part of my work. There's, you know, you try you try to disguise it enough that you know it looks. No, anyway, I'm I'm, I mean I've I've been in situations where there was like an entire ad campaign in Spain for for uh, like a you know a big company that does bottled water, and you know, whoever whoever hired the art director or whatever it was, they didn't know my work, but the guy just, you know, took, in Photoshop, just took my artwork, black and white. He'll never know. it a little bit, you know, put, put this eye here and changed a few things around, but it was immediately you know, identifiable. And, you know, so that, when, when you're actually appropriating something like that, it's a little, I have a little bit of a problem with that. I feel like all, all my work is like psychically appropriating other art, you know, like I imagine, like this is gonna be a Jack Kirby panel and I don't look at a Jack Kirby panel at all, and I just filter that through my own drawing. But it's but I'm that's I'm being Jack Kirby at that moment. But so there's a you know that I think is wholly valid and to be encouraged. But people just you know taking credit for other people's work and things like you know that kind of thing never never lasts. You know people doing things like that it doesn't 
it, in the long run, it doesn't really matter, I don't think. They did shut down that ad campaign, but there's been other things like that. Yeah, you do have like, to sue like, people you know, if you can. <laughs> I mean, if you were an artist and you were just photoshopping something, it would be, I mean, what? I don't quite get why you do that. I mean, yeah. I've copied it. It seems sad yeah. for people to do that. I don't know. Yeah, all right, um, I'm getting the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm the getting the, the hook. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh,